do some math. Start out with a little bit of review since it has been an extra day since the last class. We are in the measures of variation, characteristics of data. We spent a couple days talking about measures of center. We have a list of five different ways that we can measure the center of a, a set of data. Today we're going to complete talking about measures of variation and then get started on three, four measures of relative standing and box plots. So I'm going to be skipping through some of these slides in the review just to emphasize some things or and catch things that I didn't get done on Friday. One thing I did mention on Friday is that there is kind of the poor man's uh, variation on uh, a measure of dispersion or spread, it's called the range, it's the max value minus the min value, and that's about all I'm going to say about it because the reality is we hardly ever use it in statistics. It's very simple to calculate, but can anyone see a glaring issue with this? Yes. With the extremes? Yes, defined on extremes. The outliers potentially. So it's, it's going to be very sensitive to your data, it's not going to be very stable. Turns out we've got much better ways to measure this concept of variation. But just for reference, there it is, range. The standard deviation, we talked about it. I'm going to go quickly through it again. This is our go-to statistic to measure this concept of variation. We use it a lot. In 106, you use it all the time. It's an incredibly important concept. So that's one of the reasons I'm going to take a little bit of time and go back over it again today. I added some new slides to the PowerPoint and I uh, updated the ones in Angel. So if you're following along that way, you might want to reload. Here's the concept again. We want to measure how much data values change. And you have to have a measure to something to measure against. If I'm going to say something's changing, well, relative to what? <coughs> we use the mean. So let's suppose I have three sections of 105. In each of these sections, the mean height is 68 inches, and that's the dark blue horizontal line. The blue uh, uh, diamonds there represent heights. In each of those sections, the height, the mean height is 68 inches. But you, you wouldn't say that they're very similar data sets, would you? Something's going on there. And what's going on is what we want to capture. It's the up and downness of the heights. The amount that they change about the mean. And I deliberately uh, fudged these data values. So the first one has a mean of 68 inches, but not a lot of variation. And the third one has a mean of 68, but a lot of variation. These next three slides, I, I'm motivating the definition of standard deviation. So that's our concept, that's our goal. We're going to use the mean as our standard. How far do we vary about the mean? One way we could do is just look at, for any different uh, given data point x, we could just subtract x bar, the mean, from it and say, what's that distance? And that's got a problem because individual differences can cancel each other out. And when I add them all together to get a measure of variance over all the data points, what's going to happen? Well, the pluses could cancel out the minuses. And my measure, my statistic, might be zero. When in reality, there's a lot of variation. A good concept, but not quite there. The good, the good part of it is this idea of using the mean as my reference point. So we're measuring variance or deviations about the mean. We can fix it pretty easily. And the way we fix it is we just square those deviations from the mean. X minus X bar, that quantity squared. Okay? And keep in mind that here X is a data point. It's a value. It's something I've measured. In our example, it's the height of one of you. And I'm subtracting from that the mean of all the data points, and I'm squaring that. And that gives me a positive number. And I'm going to take that number for all the data points, and I'm going to add them up, and I'm going to get this 
statistic that I call a standard deviation. Uh, I saw a hand up. I was just going to ask why, did, why don't they use the absolute value, but I can't see now. The re good question, very perceptive. We don't use an absolute value because it's just not very convenient to do mathematics with. Uh, it really takes a calculus class, but you, you can't do the things with an absolute value function as you can with a square. And the math just doesn't, it gets really messy, and we can't take it as far. That's a good perceptive question. And historically, this works the best, looking at the, the squares and deviations. This formula's on the formula sheet, which you're welcome to bring with you on Friday. I'll probably just hand out a copy of the formula sheet on Friday. I'm not necessarily concerned that you memorize it, but I want you to understand the piece parts of it. Why do we have it? <coughs> okay, that little term there, that's my deviation from the mean, a single data point, x minus x bar. I square that, so I get a positive number. <coughs> the sigma means I'm going to add all those numbers up. So I've got to measure across my, my entire data set of how far each value deviates from the mean. Well, then I divide by n minus 1. Well, why would I divide by n? or n minus 1. Well, I'm kind of normalizing. Just like in finding the arithmetic mean, I don't add up all your heights and just use that number. I divide by n. n is small n, so small n represents the number of values in the sample. Uh, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Our context right now is a sample. I'm going to switch to populations in just a minute. So that's why I have this term n minus 1. I'm kind of normalizing because someone could take a sample of 10 data points and calculate a standard deviation. Someone else could take a sample of 20. And I like to have, be able to compare those numbers. And to do that, I have to normalize them by dividing by the number of data points. We use n minus 1. More about that later. Then the last thing I do is I take the square root. Right, why do you do that? Well, I squared to begin with. I think of back of our original units. If I'm working with heights and inches, x minus x bar, that term is in inches. And I square that, I get inches squared. Well, inches squared is not a real natural unit to work with, is it? My mean is in inches. My data points are in inches. I would like to have a measure of variation that's in inches. No problem. I'll just take the square root, and then I end up with S. That's the definition of the sample standard deviation. <coughs> OK? Kind of quick tour of how we got there. And these are the properties we talked about. When can a standard deviation be a negative? I see head shaking. Good. It can't be negative, can it? It's always going to be positive. When can I have a standard deviation of zero? All the data points would have to be identical. That's the only situation. So zero is my natural uh, no deviation. That means everything's the same. There are no negative values for a standard deviation. And they just get larger, larger, larger positive values, which means my data points bounce up and down from the mean more and more. The standard deviation has the same uh, kind of Achilles heel that the mean does. It is going to be influenced by outliers. That's just a fact of life. That's true with a lot of statistics. You just need to be aware of it. We're going to talk more about outliers end of the day and Wednesday, how to identify them and maybe what to do with them. So it, it is sensitive to outliers. <coughs> it incorporates all the data values like the mean does. That's desirable. That's good. We're using all our data. And this other point that I mentioned, it's in the same units of measure as the mean. And I know at first that might sound like, what's the big deal? You're going to see that we use the mean, x bar, and the sample standard deviation, s, together a lot in expressions and equations. 
And it makes sense to do that because they're the same units. I can't subtract apples to, from oranges. I have to have the same units. And that's why we would use the standard deviation more than we will the variance. Now we use the one bar stats this class on Friday, did we not? Yes. Yeah, okay, so I'm going to skip through this. That was kind of a review of the standard deviation. Did the clocks. All right, analogous to the sample standard deviation, is sigma the population standard deviation. Keep in mind this duality that we've got going in our statistics. We have our population that has our parameters. We have our sample. Already we've talked about, when we talked about measure of center, mu is the mean of the population, and x bar is the sample mean. They're going to have the same duality now. Sigma is the population standard deviation, and s is the sample standard deviation. The pattern you're going to see is Greek letters will, will be very consistent on this, <coughs> representing population parameters. And sigma looks an awful lot like the definition of S. What's different? Well, instead of an X bar, I have a mu. Makes sense because I'm talking about population now, aren't I? So I'm going to use population stuff, like the mu. And instead of a small n, I use a capital N because that's the number of data values in my population. Or a small n is the data values in my sample. So really, we've pretty much done a one for one exchange from population notation to sample notation, there's just one difference, isn't there? What is it? So minus one. Yeah, n minus one. Why do we have that for the sample standard deviation, not for the population standard deviation? Well, I'm going to get to that. <coughs> but first, we're going to talk about variance. And the variance is the square of the standard deviation. And I literally mean s times s or s squared. That would be the sample variance. So this is standard deviation. This is variance. But be sure you prefix it with sample, or in the case over here, population, sigma squared is the population variance. <coughs> there, you, there are really two ways of looking at the same statistic. You'll just see that there's, there'll be cases where we use sigma, and sometimes we we'll use sigma squared. But the real workhorse, the statistic we use the most, would be the standard deviation, sigma, and the S, going back to that reason again, it has the same units as the mean. So I can use it in expressions with the mean. And that just summarizes the notation <coughs> I have on the board there. The other little note is that on your TI calculator, the sample standard deviation is S of X. And the Population standard deviation is sigma sub x. Now, why do we use n minus 1 in the sample standard deviation? It's because of this concept of a biased and unbiased estimator. And this is one of those times I'm going to wave my hands a little bit and ask you to take a leap of faith, all right? We're not go, go to, going to go through the mathematics demonstrated, but just uh, believe that this concept of bias means that a statistic is a good, and it's kind of a good housekeeping seal of approval for a statistic. This statistic, for my sample, I'm guaranteed it gets close as I want 
to my population parameter. So we'll see the mean is unbiased. That's a good property. It's like, as, I, as I take more samples, larger sizes, I'm guaranteed that this is going to go get close to that number. Well, S squared is an unbiased estimator of sigma squared. I'm guaranteed if I do it enough, large enough samples, this is going to, the author uses the word target. Now here's where there's a little twist. This guy, S, is somewhat biased estimator of sigma. And we reduce the bias by dividing by n minus 1 instead of n. And that's the end of that story. That's not critical for you to be able to uh, reproduce on a test. It's more of a, that's why we do it. It's to make this a better estimator of this, which is what we're all about, using statistics to estimate parameters. We've talked about the usual and unusual rule. And we said, in general, 95% of values are within two standard deviations of the mean. Now that's not a mathematical theorem. It's not always going to be true, but it's it's close enough, often enough, that it's a good rule of thumb. 95% of the data values will be two standard deviations of the mean. And here we're talking just about any data set. Yes, you can get the pathological examples and violate it. But for most of the time, that's how it works. Now, it's a special case of this. It's uh, what we're calling it the empirical rule. Get everything in name. Now this statement, this general rule of thumb was for any data set. Now this empirical rule is for data that's distributed normally, the bell-shaped curve. In chapter five, we're going to work a lot with normal distributions. If I go from this very general statement of any data set to the more specific normal, normally distributed data, then I can be more precise and say that within one standard deviation, I have 64 point, or 68.26% of my data. And within two standard deviations, I have, uh, what's that, 95%, and within Three ninety-nine point seven percent. All right. Here's here's the important takeaway of all this. The standard deviation measures is a useful measuring stick to see how far you are away from the mean. And that helps us identify usual or unusual values. If you're more standard deviations from the mean, you're more from the center of the data set, and you're more unusual hence you're more unlikely to occur. And we'll be using that kind of reasoning a lot in 106 when we do it in inferences. All right. A caution. We shouldn't uh, compare variation or standard deviation in two different data sets particularly if they have different means. You shouldn't compare them directly. And the reason is, when you look at the statistic, how it's calculated, we have x minus mu squared, or x minus x bar squared. When the x's and mu's get larger, then I square those differences, I get even larger numbers, don't I? So it's very natural for a population with a larger mean to have a standard deviation that's larger than a population with a smaller mean. I can't compare standard deviations directly. But we can do the following and use a, a very simple concept called the coefficient of variation, or CV. 
And all I'm going to do, and whether I'm using a sample or population, is divide the standard deviation into the mean. I'm looking at the percent, the proportion of the standard deviation to the mean. And notice when I do that simple calculation, what would the units of a coefficient of variation be if I end up doing this division? You see that? Suppose we start out in inches. Standard deviation is inches. The mean is inches. Then what's the coefficient of variation? Inches divided by inches, cancel out, I get a pure number. And that's another benefit is I can compare this number because it's not in any particular units. So I can compare standard, I can compare coefficient of variations in one population to the other. Let's do an example. This will help. Let's consider, for example, a uh, population of, of males. And assume that that's the, uh, those are the means and standard deviation of the heights and weights, respectively, for an adult male population in the United States. <coughs> but what I just said is you really shouldn't compare this number with that number directly for a couple reasons. First of all, they're different units, and the populations have different means but I still can compare this concept of variation in the two populations by just doing this simple uh, calculation of the coefficient of variation, which is the proportion of the standard deviation to the mean. So for the heights, it's this calculation, and I get 4.42%. How do I interpret that? Well, that's saying for adult males, the, the, the standard deviation of the height is 4.4% of the mean. For weight, it's 15.26% of the mean. Weights vary more than heights. And to make, to make this real, the AFR class came up with the example actually walking around Walmart. If you're walking around Walmart, what's the probability that you'll see two men, one who is twice as tall as the other? Not too likely, is it? Not too likely at all. What's the probability that you'd see two men, one is twice as heavy as the other? That's probably going to happen. Why? Well, when you get down to mathematically, why? We're not getting into diet or exercise or all the other reasons. Mathematically, it is that this coefficient of variation is almost four times as large for weight. Weights vary more than heights, bottom line. That's why we'll see men that weigh twice as much as each other, but not a man that's twice as tall as someone else. Okay? Any questions? This is wrapping up this concept of variation and how we measure it. And then I'm going to start going to 3, 4, uh, the final section in this chapter. Going once, twice, sold. All right. So be it. <coughs> standard. We've talked about centers of measure, center, uh, measures of variation, and now we're going to talk about measures of relative standing. And the first thing we're going to talk about is the z-score. And I always give you hints when things are important, if you have your highlighters with you. Now's a good time to get it out. The z-score is very useful, and you're going to see it a lot in 105 and in 106 in various disguises. <coughs> 
z-score is a way of being able to compare data values from very different populations. And the way I do it is I calculate how far a data value is away from the mean in terms of in yardsticks using the standard deviation as a yardstick. All right, now that's the wordy part. Let's actually look at it. It's that simple. Again, I have the duality of a sample population. Always keep that in mind. Samples have X bars and S's. Populations have mu's and sigma's. I can calculate z-scores <coughs> on either a sample or a population. And it's just that simple little equation. That's an important one. That's my deviation from the mean. And I'm dividing that, showing that as divided by standard deviation, which is really saying I'm this many standard deviations from the mean. And again, that's a unitless measure. Uh, if we're working with heights, that would be inches minus inches divided by inches. So I end up with a pure number. The z-score is just a number. So I can compare a z-score of a height with a z-score of a weight with a z-score of an IQ. Now this ties into these previous steps. We're thinking about, well, what's an unusual value of my data set? And we have this in this rule, plus or minus two standard deviations. But well, wait a minute, a z-score is just the number of standard deviations that I am away from the mean. That's the z-score is just another way of going back and restating this rule of thumb. Ordinary values will have z-scores between minus two and two. Would be no more than two standard deviations below or above the mean. And we said that typically is 95% of the data values. And we've been kind of uh, loosely saying those are ordinary values and these are unusual values. And the distinction we're making, well, about 95% of the time, that's, that's the typical, usual, ordinary value. If it's beyond two standard deviations, that's going to happen only about 5% of the time. So that's unusual. That's atypical. So z-scores are just a quantitative way to really state this rule that we talked about earlier. All right, let's get some practice. Would you get out your calculators, please? I took, uh, I took the sample of your heights about a week ago. And I've calculated for this section, the mean height is 68.9 inches, the standard deviation is 3.05 inches. Would each of you calculate your z-score? You're going to be the x. Your height is the x to this formula. The x bar and the s are given. Calculate your z-score. Set. No. Okay? 
you should be able to get this instinctive feel of a negative and a positive z-score, what they would mean. Okay? Is anybody a z-score greater than 2 or less than minus 2? No? What was yours? Uh, just maybe minus like 1.32. Okay. Let's work with these some more because it's an important concept. Let's go back to these. Uh, uh, let's go that's supposed to be an x bar in an S. It came out as an x dot, doesn't it? Suppose those are the mean and standard deviations for heights and weights of men. And I'm posing a question. What's more unusual? A man that weighs under 237 pounds or one that is 76.2 inches tall? Okay? Well, we can answer questions like that. We can't compare them directly, obviously. We can't compare pounds to inches. But if I have this information, and again, that's an X bar, I can calculate the Z scores for each of those uh, data sets. So within the heights of all men, a man who's 76.2 inches tall is 2.6 standard deviations from the mean. Is that an unusual height? Yeah, it's more than two standard deviations, so that's a bit above uh, the cutoff point. But what about the weight? It's these scores 2.45. That's an unusual weight. Which is most unusual? A weight of 237 or a height of 76.2? The height. The larger the z-score or the further the z-score is from zero, that means that data value is more unusual because I'm getting out to the extremes. Make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's do another one. Who's more unusual? Jones with the Z score. We're looking at heights now 1.86 or Smith negative 2.1. Yeah, don't let the negative sign confuse you. It's I'm looking at how far are you from the mean. Smith is obviously the shorter. He's Two standard deviations below the mean. Smith is 1.86 above the mean. I don't compare the absolute, I don't compare just the numbers, I compare their absolute values. How far are you away from the mean? And if your Z score is zero, it means you are the mean. You're right at the mean. Alright, let's have a little fun with this. Now a burning question. Bird versus Gretzky. Who is the better offensive player? Larry Bird or Wayne Gretzky? How would we answer that question? Looking at points per game, but wait a minute, basketball is a lot different than hockey. How could I compare and make an argument that one was a better offensive player than the other? Use these scores. Uh, the NBA, actually, I, I found a, an Excel spreadsheet that had statistics of every person who's ever played in the NBA since the start. <coughs> Statisticians love stuff like that, right? And as of that date, the mean points per game of anyone who's ever played in the NBA was 6.59, and the standard deviation was 4.94. I know that. Those are mu's and sigmas, They're populations, right? Now, the NHL is a little bit more of a guess. I did hunt around statistics. There's plenty of statistics up there. But uh, I think it's something like a mean of 0.035 and a sigma 0.55. Now, with that information, then I can calculate the z scores of Bird and Gretzky, and I would get a slight difference and say Bird is a better offensive player. Why? What's your argument? Okay, so the Z-score, what's the Z-score 
me. Just if you're talking to your grandmother, your grandfather, and explaining the z-score, say bird z-score is 3.57. How would you explain it? Compared to the standard bird, would be a better player. Compared to the average basketball player, would be better than because he was compared to the average hockey player. Yeah, that's the idea. We're comparing each row to their own peers, aren't they? Amongst all the NBA basketball players, Burr's average was 3.5 standard deviations above. So in his population, he was exceptional by 3.5 standard deviations. Gretzky, in his population, was also exceptional. His standard deviation is 3.43. Now I'm getting the, I'm not sure those precise numbers. Maybe Gretzky wins. I'm not sure. But if these are the values, then that would be the basis of our argument saying, well, in their populations, the bird is more exceptional, more unusual than the rest. Okay? Getting a feel for this? A really important concept. All right, now we're going to segue to percentiles. And the percentiles are a measure of relative standard. Think about it, we've talked about the measures of center. And where's the center? Then we spent a lot of time talking about uh, measures of variation, how things are spread apart. And now the percentiles are really dicing a population up into 100 equal groups. And then labeling that each of those groups with the number one through 100. Here's how it works. And we're going to do two types of calculations. First, if I have a data value, what's its percentile? Well, to calculate a percentile, the first job you have is you have to arrange your data values. They have to be quantitative. This is numerical data. It has to be in ascending order. So they have to be sorted from smallest to uh, largest. And think of numbering them in that order. Number one. Position number one would be the smallest, and position number n would be the largest. Then the percentile of a particular value is just the number of values less than that divided by the total number of values expressed as a percentage multiplied by 100. Let's do an example. We'll use the Chip Mahoy cookies example, where these data values are the number of chocolate chips in a cookie. They're arranged from small to large, 19 to 30. And those are repeats, that's fine. You can handle that. There's a lot of cookies with 23 chips in them or multiples with 25s. How would I calculate the percentile of the value 23, 23 chips in a cookie? Well, where does 23 occur? Uh, Actually, that's the 10th position, right? So there are 10 cookies with fewer than 23 chips. 23 first occurs in the 11th position. So there's 10 to the left, and there's 40 total, and that's 25%. 0.25 when you multiply by 100 to turn it into a percentage. So that's the 25th percentile. That sample of chocolate chip cookies, 23 chips per cookie, is at the 25th percentile. All right? That calculation is pretty straightforward. It's more complicated going the other direction, where you're saying, I have a percentile, now tell me the data value. The way we just did it, we asked the question, I have a data value, what's the percentile? So now let's flip it around. It's a little bit more involved. In this equation, L is called the locator. You can think of that as the position of the data value. Recall that we've got them sorted from smallest to largest. So I could count them off, one, two, three, four, so on, from smallest to largest. And that number that I assign is their position, or it's the L in this notation, the locator. Where would I go to find the value? K is the percentile that I'm interested in. 
I divide it by 100 to get back to a decimal. So it's a 50th percentile, I divide by 100 and I get back to 0.5. And then I multiply that by n, the number of data points. And I get my value L. Easy? All right. Not quite that easy. <coughs> I'm not going to take you through this flow chart. I'll invite you to read it later on. I'm going to do quickly do two examples, because by the time it takes to parse all that English, your eyes are going to be crossed and the scope's coming out of your ears. But just Keep this in mind. It's easy to calculate L, but you've got two possibilities. I'm going to go through those. The L is a whole number, or it's not. All right. First, first case. In this uh, example, the question was, what, what value represents the 15th percentile? So I went through my little formula, and I got 6. And 6 is a whole number. So that, that's my L, or my position locator. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now since it's an even number, I'm landing right on a position. What I do is I use that and the next value and take the average of them, and that's my percentile. Because if you think about it, if I put my value right in the middle, 21, that gets me six to the left. I couldn't use this because that would only give me 5 to the left. That's the rationale for if it's a whole number of looking at the value in that position and averaging it with the value in the next position. Now, you could end up with cases like these two positions since it's the same number. All right, well, so be it. We still get the same integration. <coughs> with that number. Okay, what if we're looking for the 72nd percentile? I go through the little formula to calculate L of position. And now I get 28.8. Not a nice whole number. But actually this case is easier. I round up to 29, and that's the position that I'm looking for. So I go to the 20th, 29th, and that is my 72nd percentile in this data set. All right? Because I've already, the, the, my locator came out in between these two, didn't it? So I, in that sense, I don't have to average them. I'll just go over here, slide over here, and I guarantee I have 28 positions below it. Okay, some definitions now. Uh, quartiles, percentiles, and medians. All of these are interrelated. What we often do is divide the population up into fourths. We call it quartiles. So the first, the lowest 25% would be the first quartile, or Q1. Then I take the next 25%, and that would be Q2. Then Q3, and then finally the maximum value. So obviously then, I hope it's obvious, Q2 is another way to write the median, right? Q2 is the 50th percentile. Q1 is the 25th percentile, Q3 is the 75th percentile. So between Q1 and Q3, I have 50% of my data values. And Q2, which is the median, which is the 50th percentile, is smack in the middle. Now we're going to use those five data values to come up with uh, a box plot, or a five number summary. I have just enough time to go through this quickly. On Wednesday I'll come back and we'll touch on this again. I think I'll use StatCrunch to do some exploring 
of data sets. But the box plot is actually one of my favorite graphical displays. It has five pieces of information. It tells you an awful lot about the population, which is five numbers. I've got the min and the max. That's the first two. So that's my total range of values. That bar in the middle of the box is the median, or Q2. That's where, that's the measure of seven. 50% of the values are less than 68, 50% are greater than 68. And the box itself is from Q1 to Q3. That Q1 to Q3 is often called the inner quartile range. You might see it abbreviated IQR. That's where the middle 50% of the population is. So with a one quick glance, I see I have a population is this population symmetric or skewed? Which direction? To the right. Where would you expect the mean of this population to be relative to 68? Would it be higher than 68? Probably higher, right? Because it's skewed right. It means I've got some large values over here that are going to pull the mean to the right. One last, one more, and then we'll take off. For a normal distribution, remember, the box plots can give you kind of an insight of what the distribution looks like. That's what it's the key uses of. For this would be a typical box plot of a sample of a normal distribution. It's pretty much symmetric. There's the median, Q, uh, Q1 and Q3. So I've got this hump of data in the middle, 50% right there. And it's not skewed to, much, to any place, it's kind of centered. That would be indicative of a symmetric uh, distribution, probably, consider a normal <coughs> Alright, well that's a good day's work. I'll see you uh, Wednesday and I'll report to St.